So as you all know, on this channel, we specifically dive into the builder side of aviation, and I very rarely step outside of that to cover things like aviation safety or aviation accidents. And there's been a few very big losses this past year, and I feel it's time to have that discussion. Is aviation, in fact, safe? Are we building aircraft safely? Are we learning to fly safely? Or is just airplanes in general, are they safe? So today I brought in some pretty big guns to discuss this very topic. So we've got Mike Patey, Josh Flowers of Aviation 101, and Juan Brown from Blank O'Lirio. So we're gonna dive in pretty deep on whether or not airplanes and aviation is actually safe. So we've got uh, several very well experienced people here and what I'm going to call subject matter experts in many different forms of aviation here. Um, guys, introduce yourselves real quick individually and where you are standing in, on the earth right now. <laughs> Mike Patey out here in Utah, um, sitting in my my hangar overlooking uh, Katanas doing their wonderful bounce practice sessions. It's awesome. <laughs> Juan Brown out here at the Blanco Lirio Global World Headquarters. We're finally getting some much needed rain out west, and it's heading towards your direction, Mike, uh, shortly. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Awesome. Josh Flowers here uh, from the YouTube channel Aviation 101, currently sitting in Austin, Texas, my hometown. Chilly awesome. morning here in Texas. Great time to talk about aviation, though. Awesome, guys. Thanks for taking some time out of your, your busy week. This is the first week running into 2024, and I'm sure all of you are busy. Um, but for everybody sitting at home watching this, uh, I thought this was very important and I wanted to just frame this out for you all. There, there has been some, some big losses recently. And, and I want to say that because, you know, statistically the, the numbers are always there, but more recently it's, it's hit home more personally. And, and Juan and Mike spoke about this recently at an event, um, live and that kind of sparked my like, okay, Brian, yeah, we need to have this conversation. Um, so I want to bring everybody in here, um, guys, if you could just really quickly tell everybody how long each of you have been flying. Yeah, 20 years for me. Uh, soloed at 16 and I'm 61 now. So I bought my first airplane when I was 15. I've been flying for, I think 11 or I think this is 12 years this year. Okay. Um, so you, you've got a good cross section of experiences here. Um, and, and this is why I'm, while, wait, while you're here, right? Um, as I mentioned, you know, we look at statistics a lot of times, just like maybe we look at, you know, car crashes. We hear on the news every day or on the radio that there's a car crash at this road or that road. And at this point, we don't even really think much of it. Everybody rubbernecks and slows down to look at something on the side of the road. Um, and still, it doesn't hit home until, you know, somebody in your family is is lost. And um, really, really like in my face recently, it was Crichton King. Um, he, he and I spoke a lot on the phone and his dads and stuff. And and now he's gone. You know, he, he's the inventor of the, the grip lock ties, which I thought was an amazing product and just a uh, really cool guy for, for that alone. But on a personal side, he's a dad and, you know, a pilot and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I promote aviation full time now, uh, pushing the mechanical side of things of building aircraft. And this is a family thing with do it with your dad and your daughters and sons and that kind of stuff. But what happens after it's built and it's flying, you know, are we, are we building these sa things safely? And Mike, I want to lean on you on the mechanical side and like the airframe design, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, functions and that kind of stuff, systems. Um, Juan, you've done a, a lot of uh, flight time in the air as a commercial pilot, of course. So you've got thousands of hours to talk about your experience. And then this recently, more recently, accident investigation. Um, what you've seen, Josh, you come more from, in my book, the, the flight training side of things and, and see how things can go wrong from a student. So th that's why I get all of you guys together here, right? Um, so here's the big question, right? And I don't want to scare people away from aviation because I love it. I mean, I'm in it. I mean, I've, I've named my daughter's aviation names, kind of Jetta, I, Jet A, kind of, um, <laughs> <laughs> aviana avian in, in latin means airplane so i just feminized it to aviana and we got skyla which now the girls are just calling her sky right at the same time you know i want to be real with everybody you know it is airplane are airplanes safe is aviation safe you know 
I haven't even titled this yet, but I might title it something like, you know, are airplanes killing our pilots? You know, is it the airplane's fault or is it the pilot's fault that we're having having these issues? Um, uh, Mom, let me start off with you, being that you probably know some of the statistics and you shared with me off camera for a minute uh, the other day that where we we are currently at statistically. And what yeah, does that statistically, look like? we're uh, basically on course. Nothing is drastically changed. We're not statistically. We don't. We're not having more and more accidents, though. In the comment section, it seems like people think we are, but because there's more of it here on social media. They're seeing more of it in front of their eyes on social media, but statistically the accident rate is still trending slightly down overall. It's just that we are seeing more of it because we've got so much more access to data these days via social media. And and I, I can um, understand that, right? I mean, here, here's a day and age that everybody, pretty soon we're gonna be born with a cell phone and a YouTube yeah. YouTube channel, right? I mean, that's everybody's wanting in on this. And, and sharing their lives. So it is in our face. We got world news, you know, in our face too. So I appreciate that. But at the same time, you know, I just want to know, this is, this is a health check for me. You know, are we doing it safely? Are we building airplanes safely? Are we doing flight training? Uh, Josh, what are you seeing from the cockpit and from your student experiences? Um, and I'm going to go really personal with this. Are you seeing some people get in the cockpit that like they should never climb into a cockpit let, or a car? You let alone an airplane or like, what are you seeing as far as that goes? Well, I mean, it sort of ignore, ignoring the, you know, daily frustrations on the road. Of course, some, somebody cuts you off. You're like, why are you, you should never drive, you know, that kind of thing. But I think looking at flying, I'm, I'm very much a, I have a positive outlook on those who choose to learn how to fly. I think everybody can adjust and align their attitude properly to take on the task of flying and take on the responsibilities that go with it. But the, re the reality is, being a realist, uh, there are some people that just don't have the right attitude. And when I when I say that, I'm talking about safety. Safety is an attitude. Um, and you have to have, from a flight instruction perspective, the right mentorship and the right upbringing, quote unquote, in aviation to really take advantage of, of that positive safety attitude and that positive safety environment. I have seen, especially recently, uh, a lot of flight instruction operations that are very questionable from my humble perspective in terms of safety and, and giving the right message to students. Um, obviously, goals and checking off boxes are very important for flight instruction, but it has to come with the proper mentorship and, and cultivate that positive safety culture. And some flight instructors are natural born teachers and others are absolutely not. Um, and my my recent video, Death by, by Flight Instructor, was referring to a specific crash, but that's what I was trying to call attention to is not everybody is a teacher. Um, just because they have a flight instructor certificate does not mean they're going to be a good teacher. And here are some things to watch out for with that. So that's kind of where my, uh, my mission has been recalibrated in the last probably four months. And that's what I'm going to devote a lot of 2024 to in my content. And in, in a roundabout way that comes down to respect, right? I mean, just like if you're riding a horse, you need to respect the animal. Right. Before you climb on the horse, right? Same thing with an airplane. Right. And I, and I think human factors are are a massive, massive contributor. And I saw Juan nodding along with this uh, here just a minute ago. Human factors are pretty much at the core of, of most of our problems, whether it is building improperly, whether it is maintaining your airplane improperly to cause a mechanical issue. And some of them are unforeseen. I mean, you, you have a certain percentage that just pop right up and bite you. And there is really no good way to see that coming. Mike's situation is a great example of that this past year. Um, but when it really comes down to it in a lot of Part 91 operations, especially around flight schools and and just people flying around, around privately, I think a lot of it is human factors contributing to it. Um, and, and I'm trying to really focus on the flight instruction side of that. Great, great. Um, and what's ask... driving that? Yeah, what's driving this right now is this unprecedented pilot shortage that we're experiencing. So we're getting a lot of people jumping into aviation with... Uh, and we've lost just decades of experience over the last decade. And so people are rushing in to backfill all these uh, great opportunities in aviation and are kind of square filling their way in and through the system. And we're getting less and less experienced instructors. So uh, 
the whole thing is kind of spiraling into a, uh, a case of less and less overall experience and knowledge in the entire industry. And Juan, yeah. real quick, I'm going to go jump to Mike here in a second. But statistically, <clears throat> when you look at these statistics, can you see stuff that's, uh, well, I'm sure you can, mechanical versus power error? And, and what does it seem like that ratio is? Man, 90, I would say 90, 99% of the things that I talk about on my channel are usually aeronautical decision making it's the accident is usually baked into the equation before the pilot even gets into the airplane because he's making a decision to put himself into a situation where he's not leaving himself a way out he stacked the odds too far against him um so yeah 99 percent aeronautical decision making decisions is what i'm what i'm seeing all right, I'm going to pop in here real quick to talk about our sponsors. As you know, I can't do this all on my own. we got to have somebody to help fuel that truck. We try really hard to work with uh, sponsors that provide a good service and a good quality product. So let's talk about those guys right now. Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, the premier provider of glass panel avionics systems for experimental and light sport aircraft. Wide Open Door Company at WideOpenDoorCo.com your premier destination for high quality doors, including aircraft hangar doors. Warp Drive Propellers at WarpDriveInc.com, providing quality, solid carbon fiber propellers for many light sport and experimental aircraft. South Mississippi Light Aircraft at FlySMLA.com, an independent master repair center and a training facility for Rotax engines. Edge Performance at EdgePerformance.no, specializing in fuel injection conversions, performance upgrades and complete engines for your aircraft. Pioneer Control Grips at PioneerControlGrips.com. Comfort, convenience, and style. Handcrafted custom wooden grips with many styles to choose from. And visit our website at ExperimentalAircraftChannel.com for new videos and easy to navigate playlists and so much more. Speaking of fueling that truck, if you guys want to join us on our Patreon page, become patrons of this channel. Just search on Patreon for Experimental Aircraft Channel. Sign up at several different levels. And at certain levels, we even have scheduled video meetings once a month. So check that out. And Mike, you touched on this during your talk with, with uh, one at that event. You have like, a, is it a three strike system? Yeah, my three strikes are super anything, anything that normally would be, that's not a reason not to fly. But um, you start stacking the deck, um, you're, you're just begging to have no options when the things you can't foresee sneak up on you. And uh, I firmly believe that um, if, if I wasn't living that to the fullest, I don't believe I would have survived the engine failure in my legacy. Um, I was supposed to be flying the night before and it would have been a night flight over the mountains. And uh, that's a whole different equation when you're in IMC um, trying to find an, an airport um, spiraling in. That, that's a, it's very different. So it was decision making and, and not and not caring that, uh, you know what, I got to tell people on the other end, um, I had meetings to be at and I called them up and said, because of this, that and the other, I'm not coming. And um, I could have jumped in a plane and flew, but but my three strikes hit me and I was out and I flew the next day, fortunately. Um, that engine was going to go and it was going to go on the next flight and uh, it happened to be during the day. And that gave me options that I wouldn't have had. Yep. Such a perfect example. Yeah. And that's proof that, I mean, all these things, guys and everybody watching, they are man-made devices, right? They are mechanical. And even on your best day, things can still happen. And Mike, I think you shared that that engine wasn't new, but it wasn't anywhere close to being timed out either. And it just fell apart. Yeah, it was uh, it was approaching its its overhaul its overhaul time with a 400 hour extension option and then and more and more option which is in certified aircraft for several thousand more hours beyond that. So um, it had time on normal operation. <clears throat> it had time in normal exceedance operation. Then it had the option to do paperwork to go several thousand hours more, and, and it it was done. So. Uh, it, you just don't know. And I'm looking forward. I'm actually pulling the motor uh, this week on the 8th, traveling out to the airplane to pull it and send it to Pratt & Whitney and uh, get a full investigation with the NTSB. It's been great. The FAA has been great. 
through that declared emergency. And uh, we're going to find the answer and just uh, put one more thing on the, the docket of uh, things to watch with all aircraft engines and turbine engines. Mike, you haven't learned any more about the hot start, previous hot start history on that engine. I think that's a great point. Yeah. So the thing is, and that this is part of something I've been, I talked about briefly, and I think it's something I want to talk to the FAA and the NTSB um, and see if we can make some rule changes. This is this has been on my mind. Um, we now have the technology, and it did not exist before. This engine came out of a King Air flying normal operations. There was not a system that could record every second, every minute of every operation out of the plane it was in. If the pilot ran exceedance, there was no tattletale. Now the new technology has tattletale. I have a recording of every second I started that plane because of my Garmin uh, recorder. And I have everything I did and everything is perfect, but I don't have what has it before. And I would like to see some changes. And I know it costs money, but the reality is um, there's too many people to believe that there's this huge extra buffer in these engines that they can handle and um, they kid themselves. And then they want their King Air to fly 10 knots faster and they run it at takeoff power. And there's a, there's a limit to temperature over time. And uh, I don't think people really understand it. And I'd like to see some changes that re force recording of all engine data from its original conception. More data, and that's something the NTSB is looking for. There is quite a bit of pushback, but more data is going to make accident investigation a lot easier as well. And this is an excellent uh, blending of Part 121, Part 135, and Part 191 regulations. In the airline industry, we got a thing called FOQA, where all of this data is recorded all of the time in real time, and these exceedances are flagged, and the crew is notified as soon as it happens. In general right. aviation, we have the freedom to not have to be burdened with those sort of regulations so it's a delicate balance between the two but that's that's exactly where mike's going with this is um if you can learn something from the uh, professional side of aviation and bring that over to general aviation without losing too many freedoms or cost and well and let's, let's talk about that at the time it would have been freedoms and cost and expense but today it's um the it's, the, the new systems can actually record the point. And when you land and the plane connects to Wi-Fi or you're doing an update, it can send that off without you doing anything. And just, and let's be real clear. I think it's more the pilot making decisions to not shut down the engine during a startup because it's so close to starting, but it's over exceedance and yeah, I'll be fine. The problem is you need to take that option away. And uh, these new auto starts are fixing that problem in the new planes and the general aviation side as well. But, um, but then there's the operation side uh, on the pilot end and what he's allowed to do. And there's, there's these issues of if you took away everything away from the pilot, you may have a situation where that pilot has to go into the exceedance range, especially in helicopters and in a tough situation in a canyon. You may need to pull that to not crash and then go put the chopper away and, and get it inspected. But I think the recording of that data needs to become critical. It needs to become mandatory. And I, I think that's the expense is how far back do you go and do you retrofit? But certainly going forward, there, there should be only one option and that's full record and an automatic transmit back. And that's not to get me in trouble or any of you in trouble. It's to make sure that the next owner of that engine or that aircraft isn't flying on your decisions. You're, mm -hmm. you, you can make a choice if you're racing Reno, um, and you can make a choice to push to a limit that's up to you. But the problem is in general aviation, you make those decisions to overrun that engine, then you hand it off to a family. That is an option we need to eliminate. On that topic of recording, uh, I'll jump down to Josh here for a second. Josh, have you utilize i've seen some of these this flight recording stuff that even like i think garmin has on cameras and stuff and then review that with your students on has that been a useful tool or do you use that at all or something similar i use recorded data constantly um not necessarily with students anytime recently because i haven't been instructing too much uh in 2023 except for just a you know a little flight review or something every now and then but uh, a recent example with the Garmin G3X is we've been having just a little bit of a miss issue in the 172, and it happens on power reduction after the engine's been warmed up for a while. And uh, after investigating a little bit, pulling the data, finding exactly, I knew that I made a heading change right after it happened. So I found that heading change in the data from the G3X, 
looked at a little three second window of all the EGTs and CHTs and saw number three spike for just a second uh, for about as long as the roughness started. And ultimately we did a little investigating and found a cracked um, intake gasket. So that is very likely what's causing it. That Will that turn into a big issue at some point? Well, in a four cylinder airplane, it could if you get a massive induction leak on one cylinder. Sure. Um, but the that recorded data allows us, no matter what it is, to catch problems before they become problems. And being able to pull that and review it, of course, I'm not using an automatic transmission utility or anything like that with the, G, the G3X. I just suspect something is happening and I pop the card out and go look at it. Um, so I'm whether we should require, you know, mandatory transmitting and stuff like that, part 91, I, I conceive the benefit of both sides. Um, for me, I use it in a voluntary manner, noticed an issue or an abnormality with the engine and went to investigate it. And we found the problem. So uh, more data, more transparency, pulling the curtain back to reveal what is actually happening is uh, is priceless. Whether we're talking about accident statistics, flight instruction, characteristics of certain flight instructors or operations of certain flight schools, what's actually going on, what's actually being said inside the airplanes. Um, you know, that gets into a whole nother ethical issue of voice recording in the cockpit and all that kind of stuff. Um, more data means more safety in my opinion. Um, and then how we, how we actually execute that from a regulatory standpoint, that's uh, that's another topic, but I'm, I'm all for more data and it's come in handy for me for sure. Okay. Let me, let me switch your gears for a minute here. Go to more of the mechanical, the, the airframe itself, and then systems. And Mike, you've built several aircraft, uh, designed um, some components or aircraft. I know you're working with some, is it DOD stuff uh, behind the scenes? You can't talk about stuff. So from from the designer standpoint, and most of the airplanes that people fly, you know, in civil aviation are, you know, 1940s, 1960s aircraft, and they seem to be standing the test of time. And then we've got this this new era of experimental aircraft, which has become the new hype like everybody's building or having built an experimental um from a from a engineering perspective and i don't want well, you can jump in here too i don't think statistically airplanes are falling out of the sky anymore for the most part you know a lot of these guys like with with the addition of computers we're doing structural analysis and different stuff and, and they're not falling apart for the most part but what have you seen through the years whether inspecting other people's like before buying an aircraft or design into it that maybe or some weak points or if somebody's building an airplane pay attention to this maybe you should yeah. pay attention to the whole airplane but you know what I'm saying? yeah I, I know where you're going and then you could spend hours on that alone but let me just talk about just a couple accidents um that are one is one area of problem and i'll give you an, an accident that happened here um it's a while back but on an experimental builder. This builder, uh, very competent contractor, very good with his hands. He didn't know, he didn't know enough to be a builder of aircraft. And uh, his confidence exceeded his knowledge. I wouldn't say talent, talented. Um, and he crashed and I don't know how we got him out of a, a, a he, well, we didn't get him out the plane, put him out in the field. Um, virtually uninjured, but he put a automotive fuel filter inside an airplane. And I say automotive, I'm talking old school, tiny, tiny automotive. And it was in a plane that uh, he didn't do a good job cleaning his wings and the fuel, fuel filter should never have been used. It was tiny little thing, the clear see-through ones. And the plane should have never been flown without being multiple times flushed. And the thing is, he felt he did a good job and he didn't and uh, flew the plane for 40 or 50 hours. Um, and then on the trip home, engine just quit, ended up in a field, plane came apart in four pieces. He went through the side of the firewall by his foot pedals in an opening across the grass and ended up away from where the plane continued to, to come apart and was virtually uh, uninjured. I mean, walked away. Um, but he just didn't know that he didn't, that you can't just do things. And so I think if you're an experimental builder, you need to really um, step back. And I try and make sure I'm doing it constantly and saying, you know, that's a new area. I'm pushing the envelope a little. 
um, I need to recognize I don't know that and I better research it and ask everybody possible and not just rely on my knowledge. I, I'm going to go out and say, here's my thoughts. Now let me go find the experts that know this thing better than I do and let's talk to them. Um, and so I think there's mistakes being made as a builder because they don't know better, not because they're being risky. They just don't know. So we get uh, a, a shot of humbleness. And before we close something up, get a third party or several third parties come and inspect your work. Yeah, even before you, even before you, not just closing it up, before you decide to put in something that isn't already absolutely known with that engine combo, you know, it, you just need to really check everything and be a little more thorough. Don't, don't be, you're already going to be a test pilot when you fly it. Don't be an experimental part test pilot from something you don't know if it will fit. You know, just don't make those decisions. Just step back and say, unless it's already 100% known, I better ask and be, be careful. That's okay. where experimental aviation requires extreme mentorship. At our local airport, we have got a rock solid group of very experienced uh, experimental aircraft guys that are building RV4s and 6s and that sort of thing for years and years. We've got the local EAA club, which they are a part of. And then before anybody ventures out with their experimental aircraft at Nevada County Airport, they are very carefully mentored through the entire building process of their aircraft with this group of very experienced builders. And yeah, even we still had one guy with a um, unapproved automotive fuel boost pump situation and circuit breaker that brought him down and turned out to be a fatal situation. And Nate was advised by the group to not have that system or to change that system. So experimental aircraft offers the greatest freedoms and the some of the greatest potential in aviation, but it, it requires extreme mentorship. You don't wanna be working in a bubble on your own. You don't know what you don't know. You gotta get together with the group and, and have your work continuously checked as you progress through your build and and then especially up to the um test flying stage one of the things that uh, i want to bring bring up here quickly and that is you know on the experimental side of things we pride ourselves and be able to put anything we want into our airplane right mike um at the same time i've learned working behind the scenes here and interviewing people and seeing different manufacturing processes and stuff that very same thing that we fight and push back against, FAA, PMA, is the one thing that's really lacking <laughs> in the experimental side because of traceability, right? It's one thing to have an awesome idea and to have an awesome concept, but to actually put that into your airplane, go fly, and then repeat that part. I mean, I've come across people that literally buy stuff off of Alibaba.com and put it out there as a product, which, you know, has, has no traceability i mean kids could be making that part for all we know in some other country right yeah. so that's one thing i want to share with everybody is like really do your research with the companies that you're working with especially on the engine side of things or even avionics has been a lot of experimental you know put together avionics stuff and like as much as we don't want the fa pma stuff in the experimental because it's more expensive and it's, it's this and that the bright side the good side of that is for that is traceability and quality of parts. Not saying that it can't still break, but it should have a certain standard, correct? Yeah. The other side we're dealing with is the, the mechanical side, the mechanic itself side. And that's an area um, I think we need to follow some of those same processes. I think just like Juan was talking about, we have these educators teaching people to fly that maybe weren't educated as good as the guy before him and the guy before him. And you sometimes get this, this degradation uh, of, of copying an instructor, copying an instructor, right? Um, I also see that there's great instructors that step way up and then they kind of reset that downward spiral. But we're having it on the mechanical side. And uh, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone knows this. Um, that isn't close to me, but I have now declared my second emergency in a couple of months. Um, I had to declare an emergency just recently in Las Vegas in a certified aircraft since I declared mine in my turbine legacy. And uh, I took off um, out of North Las Vegas in a turbo Cirrus of mine and was out over the red rocks to the left, smooth, clear day, perfect. And uh, my oil pressure just dropped. 
I laid the plane over, declared an emergency, started looking for a spot, but the oil pressure still stayed uh, up high enough that it was holding. I kept my altitude high and I, 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 I mean, I declared an emergency that well, I bet you within less than a one second. I have, I have no fear of declared an emergency. If anyone has that fear, get it out of your head. You declared an emergency is the fastest, most instantaneous, um, uh, immediate relief and, and ability to do whatever you want and get the assistance you want. And I landed, uh, made it back, did a heavy slip and stuck it down in North Las Vegas. I just got the information back this week that that uh, somebody, and I, I don't do my work on my certified planes. I, I send them to local, I send it to the Sierra shop. I send my Platus to a Platus center. Um, and uh, somebody who had done uh, um, some work on it, used some heavy RTV where there shouldn't be Mm. Uh, and that RTV went into the uh, oil lines and clogged them up. Mm. Okay. And uh, that was um, likely, and we're going to get to the bottom and I'll get more details and uh, there's obviously no ill intent, but if I had been a little farther, I would not have made that back and I'd have been a, a either landed in, in a dirt field or a runway or this or that be my first choice and, and next choice is parachute. Um, uh, as a daytime, I think it would have had a reasonable chance of getting down, but that's a situation that you may not live through. And the guy who did it probably doesn't know that, uh, there are certain locations on the engine. You can't do that. You just can't put the gasket is the gasket and you put it on and that's it. And, uh, there's a, there's something people learned in engines and engine work where maybe their block had scratches because they were aggressive with taking off the last gasket and there's a groove in it. So they put RTV and a gasket and they pinch it. And that RTV goes into the engine galleys. Well, mm -hmm. someone, someone took, a, took a little bit of um, extra RTV and almost cost me uh, another aircraft incident. Uh, fortunately, it didn't. I got it down and the engine's being uh, pulled apart. Um, but, uh, that's a mechanical problem. And I think really we need to be thinking about mechanics don't mean to make mistakes. They're making the best decision that they know, um, through their education. Um, the people building the parts can make the same mistakes. The people flying the plane can make the mistakes that they can make. You stack them all together. And there is a reason there is emergencies declared and incidents that happen. And that's why I think the most important thing to do is to recognize that when you're training for that engine failure, you're really looking at the facts and not trying to blame it on the, the wild cowboys that are doing crazy things that are the ones dying. Grab reality and say to yourself, it's not necessarily the cowboys that are all dying in airplanes that are making horribly obvious bad decision making that we all want to grab onto and say it's because of that obviously mm -hmm. dumb thing and and really recognize the whole the whole Street chain Street. of of all those events can have a honest mistake failure or broken part it sneaks up when you're flying it and you need to be trained prepared and make the decision making to give you all the options possible to get out of that situation. On, on that note, I want to roll next into survivability here real quick. And, and Mike, I want to talk on the mechanical side of things, what could be designed into an airframe moving forward. But first, I, I want to talk about uh, flight training. And this, everybody chime in on this, right? Um, I've heard several people say that the greatest thing you could get, because people think that an engine stops running, that the airplane is just going to fall out of the sky. It's, it's not true. It's, it's also a glider. It just doesn't have the same ratios. Would it be moving forward, 2024 moving forward, being everybody's interest to go out and get a few hours of glider training to be able to get true energy management back to an airport to a safe landing? And have you guys experienced glider flight? I'm going to say 100% absolute yes. And I'm going to start with uh, two types of different kinds of training. First of all, the answer is easy, an easy yes, because any kind of training in any kind of aircraft is going to make you a better pilot, period. I don't care what it is, but I'm a firm believer in aerobatic trainings. I went through all the levels um, and I continually go back. I, and oddly enough, I don't necessarily like aerobatic training because it, you can get it after a little while, 20 minutes, I'm pretty well done, you know, 
but um, it makes you more comfortable in situations. Glider, it's odd you say glider. I just bought my first glider. Um, I, <laughs> I've had enough gliders in aircraft declared emergencies over the 20 years that uh, I thought, you know what? That is a rating I don't have. I've, I've chased the rest of them. Uh, and uh, I don't have my glider rating. So I just got one and uh, delivered it to a location for an annual and I'm gonna start doing glider. Um, that just goes on the premise of, I would like to learn all I can in all areas of flight to see what tricks I can pull together to, to increase my survivability if I need to declare another emergency sometime. That's Gosh. just my thoughts. I would argue that, uh, okay. yeah, you can get a lot more experience in sailplanes, gliders as well, but also you can learn a lot of those same basic skills if you got a back to basics kind of airplane like the J3 Cub that I recently picked up. It's just a, a, a low speed aerodynamic laboratory every time <laughs> I go flying and it's real back to grassroots aviation and it's uh, and you can learn a lot of the same things that you're going to learn in the sailplane in the uh, in something like a J3 Cub, a real back to basics training sort Agreed. of program absolutely and uh, also i would add that i i don't have my glider rating and I, I haven't gotten to that quite yet never been in one but it is very important to learn that energy management and kind of understand i always see a graph in my head when i think of an engine failure and the airplane turning into a glider you you have a, a total energy value and as you are gliding that total energy is decaying at a certain rate you can trade altitude for speed and vice versa and you can do certain things to take advantage of the energy that you have in the moment as it's decaying. But once you don't have your engine, that's, you have no energy to add to that equation. That being said, I also think it's very important to get very familiar often a few hours per year at the very least is what I would say, uh, get a feel for how your airplane that you are primarily flying glides. Because at the end of the day, if you know, if you're used to the glide ratio and a sailplane, and then you have an engine failure in your 182 or whatever it may be, uh, that muscle memory is not going to be there. That that immediate judge of of your your virtual glide ring in your head looking out the windshield is not going to be the same. So if you're flying a 172, absolutely ease that power back or take an instructor with you and ease the power back and just see how far you can get. Get a feel for that angle. Get a feel for what the wind does to you in that regard. Whether you're flying a Cirrus, whether you're flying a Pilatus, whether you're flying any any type of airplane, get familiar with how it glides and run those drills often. Yeah, yeah one I, of the things that I saw um, very recently, somebody finished building the same plane I'm building, a cruiser, and they're used to coming in with power or blipping the throttle a little bit right before landing. Well, he finally went around and, and pulled complete power at idle, and when he came into land, he found out he still needed throttle. He needed more airspeed to carry through down to the numbers to be able to flare properly or land on the nose. And you wouldn't have known that unless he practiced it, right? And going back to the glide, the reason why I think it would be important, and thanks for guys for chiming on this, is that um, with a glider in that training, you're absolutely committed to a landing spot, right? There, There is no put power back in. It's like, it's, uh, I think that would help you in the engine out process, like decision-making, pick a spot, that's it, you're committed. There's no going back from that and then manage it going down, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah, and I, and I think uh, I think the, the last statement was absolutely spot on. Uh, I'm doing the glider for the sheer fact that I want to fly more and become better, right? You want to be better, a better pilot every day for the rest of your life. And if you aren't doing that, maybe you should stop and get out of aviation. If you have got to the point where you said, I got these ratings and now I am good, then I think you should revisit your thought process or get out. I, I believe that um, you're only as good as you are during your, your highest level of training. And then you're either getting worse by the day or better by the day. Just because you've got the license doesn't mean you're still a good pilot. It just means you got there. So I, I wanna learn every day, but um, I think that the spot, and I got a little sidetracked there, um, that Josh made is the most critical. What are you flying today? And do you know that plane well enough that you're gonna get it down safely? Um, doing the glider thing, I, I'm doing that for that those reasons to become better at 
that management and just learning a new aviation skill. But the best thing you can do is know you're playing so well that you don't second guess anything. The second guessing you don't have time for that man energy management Josh was talking about is absolute. It's physics, math, and engineering. It's what I live by. There are numbers and I don't care how good you are or how fast you are, the numbers will end and that chart will give out and you're done. And uh, knowing your airplane is paramount. So on the topic inside of- Inside the envelope. On the topic of survivability and Mike being that very recently and very recently, you, you've uh, had to come down. Um, what the, the last couple minutes- Right, you you've picked a place. You're heading towards it. You're you're choosing to fly the airplane and forget about other things. And those last couple minutes or even seconds before you get down it, and you you may or may not make the runway, but you're you're aiming for it. What are some of the key factors of mentally surviving this and uh, staying on point? Um, I honestly feel like the key factor was not in the moment. The key factor was I had pulled the engine on that very airplane so many times I can't count it. Um, when you're in the moment, you better hope you have already done it. You're falling because back on your training. You're just in training. mode. You need to go to, you can't go. I think maybe what if um, I was in IMC to the last turn. I was uh, spiraling an IMC approach to a runway at a plane that glides like a brick with controls. That's what I was flying. And um, I was IMC all the way down. And in my head, I was just doing math. And fortunately, that works for me. And, and I was doing what I already knew the plane could do. Um, and it didn't surprise me. Um, had that been the first time or Maybe I hadn't done it since I first got the plane or built the plane. Maybe I hadn't turned it into a glider a bunch of times. Uh, I don't know that I would have had the same outcome. Um, when I was doing it, I had uh, I wasn't nervous. I wasn't scared. Uh, I was focused on what I had done so many times before that uh, it was comforting. And that sounds weird when you're in a moment like that, but the comfort of going, this good, I'm on this. I need one more turn and then I'm gonna set up and use my downwind leg for my distance to turn back. And, and in my head, it, it felt good to know I was where I wanted to be as I was coming out of the clouds. Um, it, it felt good in the circles, knowing that this circle is gonna put me on the right runway for the, the winds that were there. Um, I, had, I had comfort in knowing if I hadn't done the training, I would have no comfort. Who knows where the outcome would have been? I'd have been slinging from the hip a little more per se. And that's to me, I think the biggest maybe concern for everybody is like, you know, how will I react in this situation? Will I freeze up? Will I throw up? You know, and it's a matter of sometimes seconds. And that's the thing about aviation to me that is a little bit scary. And this is people say that I accept the risk, but but do you? This is not a forgiving sport. You you make a mistake and it's over. Right? And you, I'm not you trying have to scare to have people, a, but you have to have a fundamental survival skill set before you even get into aviation. You have to continue to nurture that skill set uh, along your aviation journey before you step into the cockpit. You have to have a fundamental survival instinct for that what you're getting into. Hey, Josh, you, you shared stick, with me but, you shared yeah. with me a while ago on on some of your flight training or just what you've adopted yourself. And this is, I'm sure, more of a uh, climb out situation. But the second you hear the engine change, you push. That's one of the things that you teach people. You want to expand on that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Well, on what you just said, you know, what are you going to do in that situation? Are you going to are you going to panic? Are you going to throw up? Are you going to feel uh, you know, what are you going to feel and how are you going to react? Well, in my opinion, you have control over how you're going to react. It just entirely depends on how familiar this scenario is to you. And that comes right down to your training, your personal drills that you put yourself through, pulling your engine back, seeing how this airplane glides and preparing for it in different scenarios. It is part of my checklist. I use an electronic checklist so that I can edit it and customize it. Uh, 
no matter what airplane I'm flying, I do a pre-takeoff briefing. I measure down the runway on whatever chart I'm using. And I, this is my abort point. If something happens before this point or we're not rotating by this point, we're aborting the takeoff because something is definitely wrong. After that point, this is what we're going to do if we're below this altitude on the altimeter. And by verbalizing all of that stuff, even if I'm by myself, no cameras, it doesn't matter. I still do it. I am using the law of attraction to put that scenario in my head so that I can just be mentally ready for that engine to cough, for a cylinder to give out. Um, and it really came in handy at one point. Uh, it ended up being not too big of an event, but my dad and I were actually going to go do instrument approaches at night. We were climbing out of the 172, about three or 400 feet off the deck, just took off. And the engine just lost probably four or 500 RPM on climb out right there. And it really got our attention. But our first instinct was put the nose down because my dad and I trained this together all the time. And we put the nose down, healed it over, told tower in the turn that we're coming back around to land because of an engine issue. And they just said, clear to land whatever runway you, uh, you'd you like. And we put it down on the opposite runway. Um, that was a, That's a very lightweight example of that training coming in handy. Um, but it's really important to drill. And it's, not a, it's not a lightweight example. I mean, I, I want to emphasize little coughs and little hiccups um, mean take immediate action. And I think some people, sorry, and I really didn't mean to interrupt, but I see yeah. people have coughs and hiccups in their airplane and they say, yeah, I was kind of running rough. Well, when did you know that? And they tell me and I'm like, Are you, you finished your flight? Or went back up the next hour. What, yeah. what do you what do troubleshoot? You, how are you telling me this story? Like, are you crazy? Right. Put the plane down. And so, Josh, I, I commend you. I love that. Um, there are people that, that it, I don't care if it's 50 RPM, 100 RPM. I don't care what it is. If you get a indication of anything, put it down. You're done. The flight doesn't continue. Right. I think there's complacency or people have... This plane always makes a little funny miss or a little this or a little that. We'll figure out what that is and fix it. Stop flying it. Absolutely. Fact, it might not be a funny little miss. It might be 400 RPM like you had. It right. might be the whole engine. You know, put it on the ground. Think about it when you're there, complaining about what hotel you're staying in rather than um, right. your family picking you up in a field. Right. Exactly. At, le at least you'll be alive to swipe your credit card at that hotel that night. You know? That's right. Um, yeah. So when it, when it comes down to your own recurrent training and, and general aviation part 91, I'm not, I am not one to call for more regulations, more mandates or anything like that. I personally think our one hour of flight, one hour of ground instruction every 24 calendar months is a joke. It's really a joke. Um, we need to be training a hell of a lot more often, whether it's by yourself running through predetermined drills that you write down, take a CFI, take a fellow pilot and be safe about it. You know, don't go horse in the airplane around and yanking and bacon and, and calling it training. Uh, but, but run through some scenarios that are known to cause hazards to, to pilots. And the more familiar you are with a variety and a, a, a collection of scenarios, the more likely you're going to handle it properly and promptly when that real situation does come up and say hi to you in the middle of a climb or when you're up in IMC or Mike, you were uh, up in cruise and, and that happened to you. And you, you've drilled that stuff before. Like you said, you knew exactly what to do. Um, so drilling it and, and being familiar with those scenarios will take away the, the unknown variables in, in your reaction when the time comes, not if, but when the time comes. So what you guys are saying and, and Josh, you're, you're preaching to the choir here is don't mm -hmm. ever treat flying your own airplane or somebody else's airplane. Like you're going for a Sunday afternoon, driving a convertible, have an actual plan for every departure and every landing. Even if it's your own airport, maybe that's going to be the same plan. But if you go to another airport, create a new plan SOP for each actual flight. Absolutely. And, and brief it, brief it thoroughly. And I watched y'all's talk in, uh, in Utah. Um, and it was a really, really fantastic talk. And Mike, I love your three strike game. And I kind of do something similar. Basically when I'm flying a single engine, that's already like, that's already strike one. That like, is strike like, one. Yeah. Um, and, and then you also <laughs> spoke on, uh, spoke on night. So, so, you're, so you're always you flying. You're always about to fly with strike one. You're always at one. <laughs> Right, the engine risk assessment it, matrix. Oh, I, I'm look <laughs> at the, look at the failures of single engines, and that is a strike one. That's right, a great, 
great. I, I don't. But then how... light twins, they're right up there too. If you're not proficient. If you're not proficient, yeah. Am I am I proficient in my tw single engine operations of a twin? No, I haven't done training. There's strike one in right. a twin because yeah. I wasn't. I'm not currently proficient. Absolutely, absolutely. So playing that three strike game like you you decided or that you described there, um, uh, that's that's fantastic. And your example of of flying the next day in turbulence is a, uh, is a prime example of that protecting you. And I think that just comes right with our safety attitude and it's, it's going to be cultural. I think that's, that needs to happen within general aviation and we need to have each other's back and, and self police for lack of a better term and, and just make sure we have the right attitude. And, and here's a point to your self police. And, and there's another way to look at that. Um, it's, it's, it's sharing your love for your fellow pilot rather than policing. That's... I think uh, we created a policy in uh, some of my backcountry guys that we would applaud those that are choosing not to do what we just did. Not say, gosh, why don't you come down? You could have made that. No, that is not allowed if you're flying mm -hmm. in my backcountry yeah. group, period. The, 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 the applauding of not taking an action because you have the slightest uneasiness, even if the plane's capable, the weather's good, the wind isn't crash winding, but something in your stomach is making you uneasy, you're out. And you need to be able to tell your friends you're with, you know what, I don't, I don't feel real comfortable this time. And your friends are required to say, good for you, don't land. We're gonna hop, we're gonna start up, fire up, and we're gonna go find another cool place. Good job, high five. And we wanna, we wanna commend the guy who said no. That's what we should do. It's a, it's, it's a great way to put it. Commend it's the guy loving said, your fellow pilot, not policing your fellow pilot. And, I love and just, that. Or egging and, them on. <laughs> yeah, or egging them on. Good grief, that's the polar opposite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, well, that brings in a whole other element to aviation to flying, doesn't it? Because it's not just about you and your airplane. Then it's around everybody that, that you're flying with or your posse or whatnot. The closest thing I could relate that to, Mike, going back to the motorcycle talk we had earlier, it's kind of like in that situation, you're 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 riding with your motorcycle buddies, right? And if somebody takes this, you know, curvy road, you're like, well, I'm gonna take that curvy road, you know. But it it needs to be the opposite as you're stating there. Yeah. And, oh. and, and then self-discipline yourself to know, and this is even harder, guys. It's easier to tell your buddy, good job for making a good decision. What's hard is to tell yourself to not land or pick another airport or not follow the group. That's the, the internal policing is much harder. Um, but I found that if, the group I'm flying with has firmly adopted this support and encourage the right way plan. It's easier for me to self-police because I'm going to get accolades, not right. embarrassment. Right. It's at the core of your, your group culture. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, real quickly going into back into the mechanical side of stuff here. Is there anything obviously our, our cars have changed a lot since like the fifties and sixties and like even our consideration of wearing seatbelts to what we are now. And now we've got airbags and side airbags and this and that. And everything's about weight in airplanes. You know, you, you shave ounces to, to get a pound here at the end. Um, aside from that though, do, do we need to, and here's the thing, right? Airplanes are designed mostly around 165 or 170 pound pilot of the sixties, which nobody, I'm striving to get under 200 right now, right? I mean, nobody's 165. Well, maybe, Josh, maybe you are. I don't know. Well, we sounds uh, heavier today than when the plane was designed. Yeah, I'm striving to be more like Josh. Um, but the reality is the average is much more than that, right? And, and the light sports stuff, we're, we're trying to make airplanes fly with 100 horsepower or less and all this kind of stuff. So it leaves very little room for safety margin of design. But sh is it time to throw some of that away? And like, let's focus on a cabin design that has airbags or like I'm sure you've run numbers on things like what would best benefit us by adding into an airplane that could survive a crash of 80 to hundred miles an hour. I mean, formula one cars do it all the time, right? Yeah. Oh I, boy. I could, I could go down a rabbit hole on this conversation. 
Um, well, maybe maybe we'll have 41, that in a separate 30 one. Chrome Molly steel frame. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's rigid and there's no flexibility. We need to absorb energy, right? We need to absorb energy oh. on impact. Yeah, I it, that is such a tough um, battle. Uh, honestly, I think one of the safest things already been done. Um, a lot of people um, kind of knock sometimes the the Cirrus parachute. Yeah. Um, you know that that is one of the lightest weight greatest return on pound per pilot survived technologies in history of aviation. And uh, it, it continues to be. So I love to see that happen. I love to see that some of the airbags are starting to happen. Um, and the I crushable seats. The crushable seats is huge for the spine. That's, that's critical. Um, I, I think there's going to be a difficult transition to like big superstructures around pilots because there's this curve of impact energy that you build this frame that's structural enough to fly is already going to be able to absorb a certain impact but what's hard to watch is when you see the speed of impact to the amount of structural material you need to protect that impact you can add huge structural improvement around the pilot but that curve of impact energy destruction is so steep with every knot speed, of increased yeah. speed that you can't, it's impractical to build enough superstructure to absorb that change in an aircraft. And so you need to start focusing on things like the parachute and the pilot training and the engine tracking log of the things that are causing the engine to fail. Um, it's going to be things like magnetos, thank goodness, are starting to go away um, because, you know, I can't tell you how many magneto failures I had before things advanced to electronic ignition. And there was this, this teething curve of electronic ignition with their inherent problems of adapting a new technology. But we're starting to, to climb past some of these things. And so I think some of the things that need to happen in general aviation, because engines, engines haven't changed for so long, is starting to come. Um, Lycoming and Continental and these people need to, kind of, I know they're already working on it, but kind of continue to, to rapid pace their, their dual electronic and full FADEC. Some of the things we're seeing is, uh, I feel like um, uh, uh, Juan and I were kind of the older oldest two here in the group. Um, where we grew up where we had to learn how to take apart our own carburetors and we truly understand mixture and, and fuel management and setting a, a set needle and a jet needle and tuning everything and, and, and uh, sorry, people don't really go tear apart and overhaul their, their, their lawnmowers anymore. Mm -hmm. They drop them off at a shop and I, I think there's this point now where we need to, to take the mechanical side and, and move <laughs> the bare basics build yes. an rc airplane there yes i think we i think the the thing best thing to do for aviation for safety on the mechanical side is to pull more of the the sometimes difficult in newer generation more specifically and that's not derogatory it's just that new generation is better at computers than i am i might be better at old school mechanics right we need to start pulling that away and giving them full fadec having someone run their mixture needs to go away. It, it just needs to go away. Uh, the, if you were to count and Juan would probably have this data, he could dig up if he doesn't, but the, uh, the amount of uh, fatal accidents during takeoff because of a mixture being in the wrong location, that the, all those deaths that are in the hundreds, if not thousands over the years. And I, I would test it would probably be in the thousands of just not knowing how to operate mixture or screwing up the mixture. In high density altitude situations specifically. Yeah. PA. People fly in, mm -hmm. in in Florida and they, they the instructor says, pull it out to this point, two fingers behind it. It's going to run perfect. They come out here to Utah and they, their engine quits when they're trying to land and they land 150 feet short and die. Like it, it just, there are things that we can do with, with technology and engineering that is going to eliminate workload and risk and just the fact that they truly don't understand mixture management, especially in turbos and other things. So those are the areas I could focus on. Shoot, like I said, we could spend way too much time on it, but I think we're getting there. We are improving. Um, and and uh, I'd like to, if any of you engineers that are building aircraft engines and things, um, 
let's really push the workload off the pilots so that they can do more time training an emergency engine failure, more time training their gliding, um, and less time training how to operate, uh, how to put their fuel in and out at every power change. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, most missionary pilots that fly out in the bush are required to become AMPs. Now, that's a little bit different story because if they fail out there in the bush, they have to fix themselves to come back. But maybe on a smaller scale, at least have some type of five-hour course or something so you have the basic general understanding other than a few black and white pages in your Jepson private pilot manual of fuel systems, right? The um, first thing I did after high school was get my AMP license, and it just paid off in spades throughout my whole aviation career and allowed me to buy and sell and own a bunch of airplanes. And we have also, besides even more important than the pilot shortage right now, we have a huge A&P shortage. We need yeah. more A&P mechanics. We need more maintenance technicians in aviation yeah, with we do. experience. Absolutely. So, Mike, a superstructure is basically going to be cost prohibitive or just design prohibitive at this moment. Um what would all of you guys say? The very one thing, you know, I've been following the Stoll series pretty closely for a, a year, you know, last year and that kind of stuff. And I saw some things happening there and they've become mandatory now, especially like at the Arkansas thing that everybody has to wear a helmet when they're competing with this. Would you say, and, and, and while I'm trying to chime in here statistically, as far as head injuries and, and that kind of stuff, would that make a huge difference if we all start wearing helmets going flying or at least have something okay. available that we know that we can put on something really quick? to uh i mean his head For injuries like a big flying, thing yeah backcountry flying can be a lot like dirt biking or motorcycle riding yeah there's a pretty good chance you might flip the thing on your lid and it might even be a slow rollover but a, a helmet's certainly going to help you when i wrecked my first airplane i hit my head <laughs> right there on the crossbar and uh yeah helmets do help for backcountry type flying especially mm -hmm. okay yeah i mean just in my own you know airplane i'm sitting around looking up and around and like, all right, people ever really think about your head doing this in an incident and it's going to do that. It's going to rattle around, you know, like a pinball. It's like, if there's any sharp objects or blunt objects, you want to remove or pad them. Right. I mean, with something goes, I mean, even just really bad yeah. turbulence. Well, I mean, it's a perfect example. And, and, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Corey Robin, he wrecked his, uh, Wilga on a mountainside with a bunch of several other planes, bush planes. And if you're familiar with that, um, he, he hit a hillside and went over the front. Um, and I got a call that he had crashed and he had some bleeding in his head, but they bandaged him up and they said, life flight won't be here for several hours. Is there any way you can come get him in turbulence? They got him off the mountain down to a teeny tiny airport in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, I happened to be at the airport. So I, I was there in no time. Got him in the got him in my plane, flew him back to the airport where the uh, ambulance was waiting for him. They got him in, and and I didn't know this till recently. He told me that uh, they told him if he hadn't got there just moments later, he wouldn't have survived um, because he fractured his skull and had internal bleeding. Mm. And uh, a helmet probably would have prevented that risk um, level. Uh, it would have just given him, but he hit the he hit his head. So backcountry flying. I think that's a really, really good option. Um, Absolutely. So I'm, I'm all about it. If I okay. had to narrow it down to one one safety innovation, I, I think it would be the, the airframe parachute um, because it is such a nice, it, it should not be an excuse to fly yourself into stupid situations, which I think is where it's it can get its bad reputation and Cirrus kind of gets that that weird stigma that's attached to it. But I think Cirrus is one of the one of the greatest, most safe airplanes out there on the market, at least in the certified world. You know, I can't say that with an absolute, but it's it's a it's an amazing airplane, uh, and the 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 parachute is just the game changer there. Um, as a more, I guess, practical, uh, cheaper safety solution that a lot of old legacy airplanes lack is a four point shoulder harness. Um, I see a lot of people flying their Comanches or their old Cessnas or their Cubs around. And one of my buddies down here in Texas, he wasn't even thinking twice about the fact that there was not a shoulder harness installed on the front seat of his J3 for his passengers. I mean, it that will, I think that could really improve our fatal accident statistics right there. Just having something to hold your torso back when the airframe does absorb that energy, when you are 
putting it down in a field or or you hit a tree line or something, whatever happens during your forced landing, having a four point shoulder harness could very well save your life depending on the circumstances. And that's a very cheap upgrade in the grand scheme of things. Great point. Great so, point. so to kind of, so takeaways here is really with this being safe and calling it safe is to have the proper mindset to be a little bit or a lot of bit humble, definitely respect the machine and, and the, the action or the hobby that you're going to do flight training and a plan for every flight. Absolutely. Is there yeah. anything else you can add to this as far as really trying to drive it home of what maybe some people are ignoring I, to be safe? I, I would like to add something that everybody can do that's a pilot or an armchair pilot or a wannabe pilot, a future pilot can do. Um, I actually believe there's probably fatalities that there's no way to put a number to that are people making comments online that uh I'll use a serious, the serious parachute Josh just brought up. Uh, I'll see people rip on the serious parachute and you're not a real pilot if you don't know how to dead stick and land on a runway. And uh, there's a variety of comments and that may firmly believe the way they feel. They feel they're so confident that they have, a, if they have an engine failure, they are 100% gonna stick it on a runway. Well, maybe hold that to yourself because just because you might be so confident that you don't need to pull a parachute and you can stick it on a runway, a road, a dirt field, hundred percent of the time, cause you're the top gun of all pilots, good for you. But what I don't like is I don't like to hear about people that had a Cirrus, didn't have good options, elected not to pull a chute and they died. And I would hate to think it's armchair quarterbacks ripping on other people's decision making one two things need to happen if you got negative things to say or things that are derogatory towards anything safety just keep your mouth shut we need to just help people make better choices if you want to have a healthy dialogue of pros and cons and what to think about when you should and shouldn't pull it i'm with you 100 percent. i'm going to be in that conversation um just remember that the things you say online to people might actually change their thought process. And when they have an emergency, they're thinking about this angry, venomous superstar, greater than everybody pilot that made some comments and then they elected, I'm gonna feel like I'm not a good pilot if I don't do this decision or that decision, take it off parachute because, because of uh, some of these one-sided conversations. Try not to have those. I, I invite everyone to make sure that the dialogue needs to happen, keep it positive, acknowledge all options that people may have. And the more you talk about a good or a bad option in all kinds of things, in all kinds of emergency procedures, um, let's stay open-minded and not discourage people from one day choosing not to pull a chute. I have personally, when I put the parachute in Scrappy, um, I had a lot of, <laughs> negative comments and they don't, fortunately, they really don't bother me. I, I invite it, go for it. Um, but I had people come up to me at Oshkosh when I showed up with Scrappy and say, thank you for saying, putting a parachute in a plane that can fly so slow and has so much suspension travel, you could probably drop it from 15 feet and suck it up because it helps me feel more better that maybe the parachute's a good thing and a good option. I had several people come up and say, the parachute saved my life and I don't talk about it. And I'm like, why don't you talk about it? And this is my point. And it took me a long time to get here. And it's not one time, it's several times. I pulled my parachute in my Cirrus and they're there to say hi to me and conversation because they're alive. And then they tell me they didn't tell anybody that they're alive that they pulled their chute because they didn't want anyone to know they pulled the chute mm. because they will be lambasted online by these people I'm talking about that make them feel like an inferior pilot for making a decision that got them home to their family. How sad is it that there are people that are alive today that pulled the chute that don't dare tell people I pull the chute because they're going to be destroyed and humiliated on their public page that their family and friends read. 
How hard is it for a person to say, I pulled the shoot when they know online that they're going to people that rip on them and then their families are going to read. If you were truly a good pilot, you wouldn't have pulled the shoot and you would have landed on a runway like any pilot should know how to do. I have read those comments. Yeah. They need to stop. That's I, why we have the additional responsibility as social media influencers right here, the four yeah. of us, to continually monitor your comment section. I spend a good portion of my day monitoring that comment section and throwing the trolls off permanently and forever from the channel to minimize this kind of online harassment and or misinformation. No, well, ultimately, I'm glad to see your emotional intensity on it because it's hard for me to read yeah. these things and, and it needs to stop. So... I am not saying you should or shouldn't pull a shoot. I'm a firm believer if you've got a good runway and you are a, you are certain you can make it, you're, you have control of landing it onto a, a location that won't risk house or home or car on a freeway, right? I, I'm a firm believer. If you can land it and you know you can land it, you stick it. But what shouldn't be in the back of your mind is I better not pull it because I'm going to be made fun of. Yeah. That, that's just a horrible thing. That's to bullying. Be done with. Yeah. Yeah. And the bandwagon effect on social media is very real. So really it takes only one or two comments and then everybody's jumping on it because it seems like it's the cool thing to do. That's why you got to jump on that comment section right away when you drop a new video and you got to uh, keep the trolls from storming the gates. That's exactly right. And like you said, Juan, too, we we have a, a responsibility, those of us with a following in aviation, we have a responsibility to, to put across, to put a positive narrative out there and steer the conversation in a way that we are setting good examples and and putting the right information out there. Let's that's I go back to data. Data pulls back the curtain on the truth. What yeah. is helping? What is working out there? So absolutely I couldn't agree more with everything that was just said. Yeah. And you guys anyway, you know, I was... made just a bunch of people mad that make those comments. So no I love you and your intents are good, yeah. but <laughs> let's have a healthy dialogue. Honestly, we we a healthy dialogue where you say, in this circumstance, maybe this, maybe that, know your airplane, know your training, and then make your decision. That's the important. Yeah, I mean, because ultimately, if you, if you don't have a shoot or can't afford a shoot or doesn't doesn't design, the airplane is not designed to shoot, you need to find a way to get it down and walk away from it. Whether it's you put it between two trees and you destroy the airplane, who cares at the end of the day about the airplane? All right, Even me, I spent 10 years of my life, not 10 years, but incrementally 10 years 10 years i finally built this plane and in the end who cares as long as me and whoever's in it walks away and can hug our families and that's that's all that matters yeah. and just like the homes. operational envelope of the aircraft you have to respect the operational envelope of the egress system as well mm -hmm. on Absolutely. that topic juan real quick mm -hmm. i might switch over to mike mike i've heard several things throughout the experimental community now and this usually is more on the stole side of things that are People are building airplanes and they can they can self-certify or whatnot because they are the builder. I've heard several people say that let, let's say light sport, right? It's supposed to be 1320, and maybe the design limit is a little bit beyond that, like 1500 or something like that. And they self-register at like 1600 because they've got more options in it or they're a heavier person. Can you tell people what that does without physically experimenting and seeing what that does to the airframe or your stall numbers or whatnot because to me that's the silliest thing to do is to certify self-certify above and beyond the manufacturer's suggested gross weight but in their defense often people say an airplane and i don't fully understand this maybe you and i can have a conversation on another episode that an airplane actually does better heavily loaded versus lightly loaded really that's briefly can you speak better, to that for a second so i Okay, first of all, let's just, that's, that's a long topic. So let's just say this real simply, and I think most people understand this, but let's just say it. The more weight you add and the more self increase you're adding to the, the, the load of the aircraft, you have to offset it with something. Right off the bat, that's going to be obviously your air speeds, your VE speeds, your turbulent speeds, your penetration speed, everything has to move. If you just move the weight up, and you didn't re-placard your airspeed indicator or reprogram your Garmin, you are risking your life and the people with you, period. Because in your mind, you're like, oh, I can handle plus three and a half G or four G. You need to just recognize that just changing the weight 
You need to lower the G limit. You can do that and safely take care of the problem and know that I can no longer fly this at this G rating, like utility category, normal category. There's categories you can move it from, but you need to move that category. It's not a hard mathematical equation. And if you don't know how to do it, there's people that do. You need to move your lines in your indication. That's one area you have to move it. The other area is you have to move the indications of how your plane is going to fly and stall. A lot of people, they increase the weight, but they don't truly understand the, 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 the outcome of where they put that weight. And they may think, oh, it flies great. I practice this, I practice that, but they may practice the stall with only them in the plane. But did they go through a true FAA practice and flight test program? Because what they may not know is they moved their CG aft. And then their placard on their airspeed indicator is set at a certain number and they approach that number and now they're loaded with more people after they self-checked off their airplane and they come in to land and all of a sudden they notice their stick is full forward. They're not even at the stall line yet and the plane comes out from underneath them and that is unrecoverable. They will die. So things have to move. The, the stall speed, maybe the wing is still gonna stall. The, the wing will still stall at the same angle attack if they didn't change the, the, uh, the, the wing itself. But how is the tail gonna hold that plane up with the changes you made? So everything has to move. Your, seat, your weight limits change, the load it can handle in the turbulence, your weight limits change, the airspeed at where it stalls, not necessarily the wing, which it does also change, but I, you need to be paying attention. It may change in the tail. So I could spend way too much time on this. If you're going to make that change, make sure you now reopen it to a full flight test program and find out where that envelope is really. And you probably want to hire a professional to do it. And you need to have a parachute on and you need to really know it because you may not know that you just made your plane uh, stall from the back end first and come out from underneath you and you, and you don't know it till you're, you're gone. And then what happens in the NTSB data? Juan will tell you this. They're all they're going to know is that there was a stall spin unrecoverable fatality and the plane's going to be in a zillion pieces. You know what they're, you know, what's hard to find. What's hard to find is that the plane actually was flying, but full stick didn't keep the, the tail up. And they came out the other direction. And, and the, the death was by design and airspeed placards that someone was flying within the airspeed placards, but the plane was not capable of flying that placard anymore. And, all the, and all those points. You, you, you won't find that. Anyway, sorry. No, Long no, I, I love it. Love... It makes me nervous because I see it and it scares me. Exactly. You're back I in test it. pilot world there. You're, you've gone yep. from experimental to test pilot once again, and we're not qualified necessarily to do that. Maybe, Mike, you are out of enough experience, but goodness sakes. And I'd love to have the, the longer conversation with you, Mike, at some point to, to dive into the mechanics of that. Um, but I do hear a lot and that is, well, I'll just pat it with a few knots or a few miles per hour. I'm like, no, you're changing everything. Like it, it is now truly an experiment. Yeah. Right? And Here's something and, and I'll try and keep this brief because I'm always long winded, but guys, you built an awesome RV6, RV10. I've built both. <clears throat> They're great. You're an experimental builder. You're a good builder. You did a great job. <clears throat> but keep in mind, you built something that was designed by an experimental company that did a great job, that did all the work that you don't know how to do, that is not in your builder's manual. All those airspeeds, all the weights, all the testing, everything before they sold you that kit, <clears throat> they did a workload that is a mountain pile of work that, that can take a lifetime to truly understand for you. The second you go out of those weight parameters and changes, you have erased essentially a good portion of that mountain and you don't know what it is. So just remember, you don't know and be careful with those decision-making. Thank you for that. That's that's well said. That's, well, it, that's where it goes from this being a hot rod project to an airplane. That's the differences, right? So 
Well, guys, thank you very much. We've talked for about an hour. Um, I know that's breaking all the rules for YouTube of like the 20 <laughs> minutes attention span, but who cares? This is really important. Um, I was a little bit nervous about, cause I don't promote, I only promote the building side of things or I don't talk about flight training. This is just, this is way outside of my league, if you will, my normal, but so many things have happened more, more recently. And I'm like, this, this is scaring me a little bit. I mean, just complete. Yeah, you should clarity. make it all part of, you should make it all part of your, um, part of your whole channel there. Yeah. I, I think uh, so. I actually Juan, thanks for saying that. I think every, all four of us, need to continue to step up the aviation safety side. It's a commitment I've, I've made to myself, my family, to do more of that in my channel when I start doing more of the aircraft builds again and talking about those things. Um, also being a little more vulnerable as all of us make our YouTube channels and uh, talk about our mistakes and um, not worry about the, the people that want to poke fun at those mistakes. The, the reality is, we have one life to live. We have one family of fellow pilots out there and we need to make sure they're hearing us. Um, and we're all human and we all have errors. We all make mistakes and we need to help each other not make mistakes. And the, the, the worst thing we can do is hide behind our mistake or away from our mistake and not grab the opportunity to let someone see that we screw up. Every one of us do and uh and share that with the world so all of you watching this uh, youtube channel i have a re uh, two requests one is when you screw up don't hide it just grab all the fellow pilots you say and say you know what i almost didn't come home last night let me tell you why because almost every pilot i know has that story don't be afraid to share it and those of you who are hearing those stories being shared online or on someone's page that have the courage to come forward and say i made a giant mistake with my airplane and I almost didn't come home. Recognize that that's to help aviation and support them in making that decision. Um, there needs to be more positive feedback for that and for those people. And uh, I ask everyone to share their mistakes and applaud those that do. And most importantly, learn from those mistakes. Should you're not the one that uh, we're talking about uh, on Juan's channel on the next accident. Absolutely. Extreme ownership through humility. All right, guys. Well, well thank the you. Blanco Lirio channel. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to show up or any of you guys show up on your channel, Juan, for sure. New Year's <laughs> resolution. Yeah. 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 Stay off of Juan's channel. That's <laughs> that's your ultimate <laughs> right. goal. That's a life. good one. <laughs> Including me. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, just like uh, was it was it Chris Rock, the comedian said a long time ago in one of his talk show, talk uh, comedian acts is that uh, my my one goal as a father is to keep my daughter off the pole. And it's like if your daughter is on the pole, you've failed. And it's like, yeah, there's some truth to that, Chris. You show up on Juan's channel. You failed. All right. All right. Let's do better. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll uh, kidding aside. I'll guys. Thanks uh, for joining in today. Um, I really appreciate it. I feel very blessed to know you, have met all of you in person, and to be a part of this aviation community. I mean, I'm I'm beyond, like, this is amazing, right? I mean, this is something I started five years ago. Like, how can I get back into aviation? And here we are five years later and getting to talk to great people like you that are such a wealth of knowledge and wisdom and have done so many things uh, for the aviation community. So thank you um, for your time today. Um, and for everybody that maybe is brand new to aviation, just happened, to, YouTube suggested this video to you, and you don't know who Mike is or Josh is or Juan, I will, in fact, leave links uh, below in the description below to go to their channels and their websites to uh, to start following them as well. So, all right, guys. Well, the next uh, event coming up for us is uh, Sun and Fun, which is only, gosh, Ooh. it seems like faster and faster wow. it gets back Bigger around fast. to, uh, right? So I'll see you all at Sun Fun here in a few months. Very good. Thanks, Bye, Brian. Brian. Thank you, guys. Back to work. <laughs>